Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews of items, and convention panels, and other exciting things that we run into from time to time. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Yeah, now I can see everyone. There we go. Yeah, all right. Now, can you all hear me? Yes. All right, good. I would like to introduce our dear steampunk, fellow steampunk, dear friend, a remarkable author, Scientist about town. Thank you. Uh, just a dapper gentleman. Well, and, and as I say, this is tonight. I, it, it is the pajama party, but I work at night, so <laughs> this, this <laughs> is my nightwear. <laughs> <laughs> so, so David Lee Summers is uh, the author of the. This wonderful series of books that we are very fond of. The Clockwork Legion series, of which the latest one, number four, Owl Riders, is now out. <gasps> so exciting. We will be definitely reading it next year for Book Club, just so you know. At David's um, so we can come visit with us. David, is there anything else you'd like to share before we have you read? Well, the only other thing I will share is that I am also, and now, like many other artists around, I have a Patreon page, oh, yeah. and if you join up for, with my Patreon for merely a dollar a month, you can read the end of my Space Cowboys epic, Firebrand's Legacy, which is in the process of doing the last few chapters right now. You can read it before everyone. If you join up as a, a patron, you will get a free copy of the book. So that, or well, a, a dollar or a couple of dollars right. digital copy of the That's book. That's lovely. So it is. So I encourage you if you go to my website, davidleesummers.com, and click on this right. book cover, you it will take you right to the link to go to the Patreon site. Fantastic. Thank you, David. I'm going to sit out of your way. David's going to read a little something for us. There are still chairs available. Mm-hmm. One in the corner there. there. Over there. Yeah. Over there. Yeah. Right, and there's some room in the the cozier room, so you don't have to stand unless you want to. So I thought well, tonight with yes. our, our wonderful setting in, in a haunted hotel. I would read a little bit of a spooky tale. Uh, this one comes from a new anthology that just came out this year called After Punk, Steam Powered Tales of the Afterlife. Yeah. And I am in it alongside uh, folks like Jody Lynn Nye, um, Danielle Lackman McPhail has a story in here. It was kickstarted, it was a wonderful success. This story was in fact one of the stretch goal stories. So it was not originally in the anthology until it was supported at a high enough level to get in, and then Danielle made me write this in, <laughs> in short order. So, this is this is a little different from my normal universe, but I thought this might be a, a nice introduction to characters for people. It is called The Sun Worshiper. Daniela Stanton had a rapport with the dead. She couldn't explain it, and she didn't necessarily want it, but she could feel spirits and channel their voices. When Professor Augustus Harriman invited her to a mummy unwrapping party, she couldn't resist. She had known many wealthy people around London had acquired mummies from Egyptian expeditions and hosted unwrappings. She so wanted to go to one. Much as the spirits frightened Dinella, they also fascinated her. She had never encountered a spirit as ancient as that belonging to 
a long dead Egyptian pharaoh. She wondered how long they lingered and what secrets they could impart. She followed Harriman's butler Talbot down the hallway to the parlor. She had never met the professor before and wondered what possessed him to invite her. Nevertheless, a thrill of excitement fluttered through her and lightened her steps. Talbot announced her, and Dinella bristled as she realized the parlor was filled with scientists, all of whom had slandered her at one time or another. <laughs> Near the punch bowl stood Martin Mitchell, a chemist with slicked back hair, who once said spirit voices that spoke during her seances were made by an accomplice behind a curtain. At the buffet, toad like Nigel Hogson chatted with Desmond Llewellyn, who once said she used wires to lift tables. Ornithologist Maurice Swift caught her eye, then dared snort a laugh as his eye shot away. He once said she accomplished spirit writing with her feet. <laughs> All those statements the scientists had made about her were patent lies. Her fists clenched and unclenched. She began to suspect Harriman invited her to be mocked by these cretinous chemists astronomers, and biologists. <laughs> she steeled her nerves and continued into the room, curiosity about the mummy driving her forward despite her irritation. Fortunately, she didn't have to wait long. Soon, curtains parted, and a man with a full beard and a mop of black hair rolled out a wooden gurney on squeaky wheels. A blanket covered what appeared to be a body. The scientist fell silent and all eyes turned to the journey. The man introduced himself as Professor Harriman. Thank you all for attending. The professor moved behind the gurney so he could address the audience. As many of you know, I recently acquired the mummy of one of Prince Neferamun from an associate in Egypt. His name means the good of the sun god. Shall we meet our sun worshippers? He grabbed the corner of the blanket and paused to make sure he had everyone's attention, then yanked it away, revealing the mummy underneath. Fake? All eyes fell on Dinella, but she couldn't help herself. Fraud? She cried. She knew what mummy should look like. The bandages should be brown and ancient. Nearly falling to dust, the bandages on this mummy were white and new, as though they had come from a modern hospital. Her worst fears now seemed justified. Professor Harriman had indeed invited her just to make a fool of her. I say, croaked Professor Pogson, your mummy doesn't look very ancient at all. Dinella appreciated that someone else in the room also seemed taken aback. Harriman handed the sheet to his butler. Please, please, I do not intend to deceive. He held his hands out over the mummy. This is a real mummy. I have taken the liberty of unwrapping it in the privacy of my laboratory and conducting some studies before this public event. To what end? Maurice Swift leaned forward and narrowed his skeptical gaze on his colleague. All shall soon be made clear. Harriman glanced down at the body before him. I assure you, I have conscientiously rewrapped the mummy, returning the artifacts where I found them. Without further ado, the professor began unwrapping the mummy, handling it with great care. Talbot rolled out a trolley and placed it next to the professor. Below the first layer of bandages, he revealed an elaborate collar of gold and polished coral. He placed it on the trolley. He unwrapped another layer and came to a pair of amulets. One looked like a cross with a loop at the top. He declared it an onk, a symbol of life. The other amulet looked like the English letter A. Harriman explained that it was a plummet which would bring balance to the deceased. Dinella walked up to the trolley and examined the amulets. They looked genuine. She dared to reach out and touch them. Love and pride of artisans long dead rolled off them, setting her hand tingling. She stepped back, blinking, and wondered why the professor perpetrated this elaborate hoax wrapping real artifacts in such obviously new wrappings. Professor Mitchell stepped up beside her and retrieved a monocular from his coat pocket. 
He made a show of examining the artifacts. At last, Harriman reached the bottom layer. He revealed the mummy's face to be no fraud at all. Brown and wrinkled, like parchment, it still appeared lifelike. In spite of herself, Dinella reached out to touch the skin. Realizing what she was doing, she yanked her hand back. No, no, it's okay, said Harriman. Go ahead, touch him. Dinella did so and gasped. She expected the skin to feel dry and rough. Instead, it proved soft and supple. So lifelike, she whispered. That's the reason for the new bandages, explained Harriman. The Egyptians wanted to preserve life, and they sustained Prince Neferaman's form, but allowed him to dry out, removed his organs, and stored them in canopic jars. He glanced around at the scientists who hung on his words. What if we could bring the prince back to life? <gasps> Llewellyn scoffed, and Mitchell gave a derisive snort. Poxon narrowed his gaze, interested but clearly uncertain. Harriman produced a set of shears and clipped the rest of the bandages, pushing them away from the mummified body of the prince. Dinella's hand shot to her mouth. The action left no doubt at all about the mummy being male. <laughs> Mitchell looked down his nose and smirked at her discomfort. Then the mummy's eyelids sprang open, revealing hollow eye sockets beneath. Mitchell stumbled backward into Poxon. The two scientists nearly tumbled to the ground. With a tick and a whir, the mummy sat up, rotating on the gurney as it turned to face the audience. What kind of trickery is this? This time, Professor Swift revealed his iron. Dinella noticed an incision on the mummy's abdomen. Harriman stepped around the gurney and peeled the skin back at the incision with a wet, sucking sound. Inside, gears turned, cogs whirred, and the springs throbbed like a beating heart. I've replaced the organs with clockworks. I can give the prince the illusion of life again. He glanced over at Dinella. This is why I had to wrap him in new bandages. I rehydrated his skin with special chemicals and ointment so he won't crumble to dust when he moves. But he has no spirit. Dinella shook her head. I feel no life from this thing. Harriman nodded. That's where you come in. Do you think you could summon Prince Neferaman's spirit, bring him back to his body, allow us to talk to him again? This is outrageous. Maurice Swift turned and flew from the room. You want me to summon his spirit in front of the very men who have derided me and my work all these years? Dinella put her hands on her hips, tempted to storm after Professor Swift. Harriman shook his head. No, Miss Stanley. I will only invite those to stay who will keep an open mind. He cast meaningful glances at Potts and Llewellyn and Mitchell. Mitchell shook his head, tucked his monocular back in his jacket, and with a derisive snort, followed swift from the room. Llewellyn clasped his hands together and bowed his head. I accused you of using wires, madam, but I must confess I had no basis for my claim. Science is the process of learning, and if you're willing to let me sit in on a seance where you attempt to resurrect the good prince's spirit, I'm willing to retract my hasty words. Dinella put her pen to her chest, surprised at the scientist's offer. She nodded. Keep an open mind, and you will be welcome. Harriman folded the flap of skin over the clockworks. What do we need for you to proceed? A quiet, dark room, said Dinella. If you have some items the prince had in life, that would also be helpful. Several items from the tomb were sent along with the mummy. Herman smiled and clapped his hands. He reached out and took Prince Neferaman's hand. Please enjoy the refreshments we have laid out. I'll prepare the room and summon you shortly. He led the mummy, ticking and clicking, into the other room. Dinella found herself glued to the ghastly sight not really wanting to see the hip bones protruding above the mummy's sunken buttocks, but intrigued by the view nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> that's the midpoint of the story. You oh. can read the rest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can read the rest. And find out whether or not the idea succeeds in oh. raising the spirit. That's so good. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. We certainly raised that. Yes. Absolutely. Bravo. Bravo. It's called After Punk. <laughs> <laughs>
Steve Howard Tales of the Afterlife, and we have a few copies over here for sale. Oh. Well, so you can really pick up copies from David. Thank you. Nice job. I love your names. Thank you. Wonderful. Yes. Danella, but it was uh, has become, held a special place uh, with me. So she's a great character. I, I think she and the professor will have to come back to the sequel. Oh, I think so. I Especially think we'll all want that. We'll all want it. So, um, so thank you, David. If any of you would like copies of David's novel or the short story collection in the library, you may procure copies. Or we'll just tell David he's wonderful. That's in that too. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. All right. So, there's still. Cocktails can be made, still nosh, we're still in danger from the brotherhood. Uh -huh. It's a really good party. <laughs> <laughs>